I did want to talk about the kind of the big topic of the week, which was NIL rules, name image likeness, and some of the impact that that could have on uh, on college basketball and the turnover in the offseason. For people that didn't know, I, th- I believe Florida has now written into law that athletes are able to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness. Uh, and Georgia has a law, which is actually kind of shitty on their books as well now that was signed in um, this week. Uh, but but most importantly, I think the big thing is, is you know, we, we look at this NBA draft cycle, and I feel like we go through this every year, right? Um, right now there are 49 players underclassmen that have declared for the draft uh, that are intending to leave school, um, according to to something that Jeff Goodman put out the other day. And in total, there have been 110 underclassmen that have declared for the draft and are just kind of going through the process. And uh, like we've seen this grow year over year over year. Um, Last season was a little bit weird because of the pandemic and the uncertainty. But the year before that, there were 87 players that were underclassmen that had declared for the draft and left early. And I'm just kind of, you know, where are you at with this day, Sean? It feels like there is... Uh, a constant talent drain in, in, in the college basketball space. And it's something that I do think there are ways to kind of make it be avoidable and entice people to come back to school. Well, there definitely are ways to avoid, uh, like you just said, to make it avoidable and entice people to come back to school. But I feel like these things uh, started happening as soon as they changed the rule for players to, you know, uh, extend their time uh, and go and test the waters and go do workouts and then still be eligible to come back. When they pushed that time, it just gave a lot more players the opportunity to, you know, take a risk and more or less like learn something about themselves from the NBA's eyes and then take that back with them to uh, college. So, I mean, I I would say uh, to me, it's not as bad because, you know, all these players want to they want the opportunity to go to the NBA. So if you have a chance to go test those waters as a freshman, sophomore, junior, whatever, whatever you are and still have the chance to come back to college, learn what you need to fix so they'll like you in the future, and as well make your team, your college team, better when you come back, I don't really see the problem. Did you um, did you ever test when you were in college? Did you, did you have a chance to do that? Nah, I never really did. I, I wish I did. I feel like uh, it would have probably helped me out a little bit. But once again, that's why, why I'm you know kind of somewhat of an advocate for it because – I think if I tested, I would have learned a little bit more about myself, could have fixed some things. Obviously, I had a a good finish and everything as far as the college basketball, but just more or less, uh, I could have uh, made myself a little bit uh, more, uh, I don't want to say presentable, but just made myself more of a, uh, (laughs) just more uh, approachable by those teams. Just fix my game up a little bit and make them like me, learn more about the game. Because what I, I didn't know much about the game, period. I didn't know much about anything except just how to put the ball in the basket. So like that opportunity to go there, learn those drills, learn how to make myself better and then get the opportunity to come back or find out if I was good enough to go would be, would have been crucial. Right. Um, my big thing, it's not that, that these guys have the opportunity to declare it's that um, like, I, I want them to have as much time as possible to be able to, to get those evaluations directly from the mouth of, um, sure. of, of NBA yeah. evaluators, right? Like, yeah. and, and I mean, both of you guys can attest to this. Uh, college basketball coaches are incentivized to try to convince their players to return to school. Yeah, for sure. Right? Like, no matter what they say, the best thing for these, these coaches is to have their best players come back for another season. That's the way they get extensions. That's the way they get raises. That's the way they get new jobs. That's the way that they help their career is to have their best players on campus playing for them, right? Yeah. So there's always going to be that incentive to try to get them to come back, no matter what they tell you or, or, or how um, vociferous they are about, you know, kind of promoting whether or not they want these guys to go. Uh, my big thing is that there's so much more money in the professional ranks now than there was even like five or six years ago. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the money you can make in the G League has gone up. There is the G League Ignite program that's created another avenue to get to the NBA draft. There are other leagues like the Overtime League that has been created. And the uh, I can't remember the name of the, the, the one. Um, I can't remember the name. Professional Collegiate yeah. League. Like there's a couple different leagues that have been created uh, for high school and college players. Um, that are going to be able to allow them to capitalize on NIL stuff. There's more money overseas now than there was before, and there's easier avenues to get to some of these these clubs. You know, it's it's in a more connected world. You're not as isolated when you're able to talk to people on Zoom and FaceTime all the time. You know, so um, with the amount of money in, in college or in, in in professional sports, I think we're seeing more players leave because they know, hey, if I can get like seventy five grand to go play in uh, like Germany for a year. 
and and do that instead of coming back to school where I've kind of done everything I want to do. Um, that that's 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 more appealing to players. My my take has always been if you can open up the NIL stuff, right, and create an incentive to say, I, I don't know how many people are going to make seventy five k in college yeah. basketball. Yeah, not many. You could do something where you say, okay, well, you come back for your junior year, you can finish your degree, right? We can yes. get you like thirty thousand dollars in in some kind of marketing revenue, right, mm-hmm. and. Um, you create that incentive to say, and you can come back, you hang out with all your friends, you're on campus, you're a guy, you're going to be playing in front of packed houses. Like the experience of playing college basketball is great. If you can create some kind of mo- monetary incentive to get guys to come back, like I, that's to me, it's no brainer. And I don't understand why it's something that is taking so long to get through and get into court. It's not like they're going to. Well, it it's taking long because the NCAA would prefer to have some guardrails included in the legislation. Mm-hmm. That's sure. why it's taking long. Which and they should. Well, well, exactly. They, they should. And, and here's the thing that I always think about with the NCAA. Now, now let's, let's take a step back here. And I have a couple other thoughts on the, on the pro route for, for a moment after this. Is that if you, if you are a multi-billion dollar association, why on earth would you change anything that you are doing? Exactly. To <laughs> that? So exactly. when people get mad at the NCAA, I understand why you're getting mad. We're all, we've all gotten worked up at some point in time on something that the National Collegiate Athletics Association is doing. By the same token, that association operates fully knowing how they're going to benefit as they should. And that is the exact reason, and I believe we're going to get into this later in the show, but the NCAA president is still in his seat because he listens to a board of governors. This is my always my thought. When a conference commissioner gets ripped on, for instance, Larry Scott of the Pac-12, Like, that conference commissioner gets absolutely ripped to shreds. That is exactly what the league in which he serves would prefer. Because there are people even more powerful than Larry Scott that sit in high rises at universities every day that don't have to face any one media member that ended up saying, we're stamping this decision. Larry, you go ahead and you figure out how you're going to do it. Like, there are people behind the scenes in college athletics that we that, that aren't in the forefront of the national landscape that end up making some of those decisions that really anger you. But there's people that are in the front facing positions that are the ones that have to take the heat. And it's not always directly their fault. I'm not defending those people, those leaders, because they are leaders, but they're answering to greater powers than even them. In terms of the pro routes, one area, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Deshaun, you play. Yeah, actually, but before you go into the pro go stuff, one, one point I do want to make about you, you're right about Emmer, right? Like he's paid his salary is two point seven million dollars. He's paid to be the whipping boy. He's paid to be the guy that goes out there and gets bludgeoned by the media. The problem in this instance is that the people above Emmer are happy with what he's doing because oh, yeah. of the fact yeah. that he's like protecting these these certain exactly that's what ideals he was saying, yeah. that right. allow the, the universities to make more money, right? But underneath the, the, the people below him, like athletic directors, conference commissioners, people that are actually in the weeds of college athletics and not sitting in some boardroom with some title at a university collecting a check, those are the people that don't like what's going on with Mark Ember. Like you can go back, Nicole Auer back at The Athletic has done some really good reporting on this, Dana O'Neill as well. Um, and the, the people that are actually in the day-to-day of college sports are not happy with the way that, that this stuff is going with Emmer. And a lot of it is the fact that he can, he's continually passing the buck on the NIL stuff. Like, and I, I hear you about how long it takes, but we've been having this conversation for like a decade, man. Like there's been, think about how long Dan Wetzel has been writing shit about this, right? Like he wrote the book on, uh, on, on the shoe. I can't remember what the name of it was, but on shoe company stuff, like yeah. 20 years ago, like th- th- none of this is new, right? Yeah, that's exactly my point. Like exactly, that- that's what he was saying. More or less, like they have an incentive not to change anything, so they're yes, gonna and, try and to. That, and that's into, why into forces yeah, into. And, yeah, no, no, I get you, but there's there's people at the lower levels that 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 are not happy about this, and I think it's part of the reason why we're seeing some of these issues pop up now with like the talent during the college basketball. To me, the biggest problem that college basketball faces is that 
they're the, the recognizable names and the recognizable faces are so limited, right? Think about how many people right now can go out and tell you who are going to be the five best players in college basketball next year, right? <laughs> Most people are probably going to say something about Chet Homer, Homer yeah, just because yeah. like everyone you know kind is. of knows who Chet Homer is. But if you went to go ask a random person on the street who the best player in college basketball coming back from last season is, how many people are going to be able to give you that answer? Not very many. And I think yeah. that is the biggest thing that we're dealing with. Even people that are fans of teams are seeing so much turnover. And look, I, I'm not – the transfer stuff I support. And I think it, we can't dive too deep into to what is happening this year with the numbers because of the fact that they're going to be inflated because there are four different classes that are able to gra- uh, transfer since seniors can put their name in the transfer portal. Um, I think a high percentage of these guys are getting run off by coaches. That, that doesn't get talked about. Like a lot of these transfers don't get asked to come back. And um, yes. we just went through a pandemic, like part of the incentive to not leave your program and not transfer is like the bond and the brotherhood and the fact that you like you're playing basketball with your best friends. Yeah. Right. And you don't you didn't get that experience this year. So was a, there's a lot of people like, yo, I got to get the fuck out of this place. Right. So to me, the biggest issue is the level of turnover and the fact that there aren't very many programs. There are just teams that are being built and nobody knows who the best players are going to be. You don't get that connection with the players. And for me, one of the biggest ways to save that is to create that incentive for players to come back to school with NIL stuff, because it's all look, life is money. Life is the income that you can make. And this is a way that you can create incentive. I'm sorry, Deshaun, I keep cutting you off. Go ahead, man. No, I agree with uh, with what you're saying and what Fanta said. (laughs) Obviously, that's what I'm doing right now. But um, I feel like we can get to those incentives with players if we do have guardrails to protect everybody involved. I mean, I don't see the NCAA rushing to make these things happen because, I mean, obviously they're trying to protect their interests. And the players want – and everybody surrounding these players want these players to get paid as well. I feel like you can do these things with creating guardrails to protect yourself. Like, for example, we talk about the transfers. With everybody being able to transfer uh, anywhere they want to, it really doesn't – like, imagine you as a a university, you get a kid that comes from – uh, Notre Dame or something like that. And you don't know if he's there because, you know, he wants to be a part of a uh, Braves deal or he doesn't, he wants to just do his own thing. So you don't know what reasons these players are here for. Like, would that make you feel comfortable to just pay him $30,000? Like just give it to him because he's a player. It's like, if you have guardrails that protect you, like if they had transfers happen, those guys that transferred in, if they had to wait to play, Maybe they wait that year and not get paid to see if they're there for the right reasons. And then when they take that year to finally get all their things in order and then they, they actually play for the team, then you could play. Things like that, like small, small things to protect the universities, obviously the NCAA and the players involved, because at the end of the day, you would have what you have right now. Do I think this will stop next year? No, I really think that if they continue to just like let people just transfer like this, this is not going to stop anything. People like I feel like people will just move because they can. Yeah. And, and if you pay, and you give them a sense of idea, them, you know you're able to, to stop here's, here's my idea on that. I, w- I want you guys' thoughts on this. So I think the way uh, to, to kind of incentivize staying at the school that you're at is, again, to, to create a monetary incentive, right? So when you open up the NIL, create a setup where you can say, okay, if it's your first year at a program, the school cannot, cannot match anything that you make off of your NIL stuff. If you're a sophomore, the school can match up to 25% of what you make on your own in terms of like third party revenue. Like uh, you sell an ad for a thousand dollars on your Instagram page, or you tweet out something about some restaurant or something like that on Instagram. You post a picture on, on Instagram of a restaurant. They pay you a thousand dollars for it. The school can match two fifty of that for whatever you make the whole year mm-hmm. on your NIL stuff. If it's your second year in a program, third year, make it be 50%. If you're there as a senior, make it be 100%. So I'm like, the, the, the numbers yeah, are whatever. Exactly. Yeah. But here's the thing. But then if you transfer, right? So let's yeah. say you're a sophomore and you transfer for your junior year. You don't have to sit out at all. The school can't match the NIL stuff that you make at your new school because it's your first year in the program. So that's just kind of a way that you can. It that's doesn't actually a nice little right app what yes. a player is capable of making, but it creates an incentive to stay at the school you're at. It's the same way as like when you like the super max deals and the, like a very different level of money, but a super max deal in the NBA where you can get more money if you stay at the organization you're with. Sorry, go ahead. But you know what, but here's the thing, what is stopping another coach or another third party member saying, Oh, forget about what the, the matching program. We can give you double that here. We have more money. We have football money. 
So, nothing, so that's the thing. Nothing. You're still going to be getting recruiting in the layup lines, and anybody's going to do what they can to cut a deal worth more. And let's yeah. also stop acting as if this hasn't already happened in college sports. I mean, it already is. It already is happening, and nobody mm. wants to admit it. And that's fine. I love college basketball. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start talking about back end deals and behind closed door stuff. But we know that that stuff happens. And here's the other thing. In the NCAA legislation that they would like to get passed by the government, it says that the school is allowed to have a person on staff or already has a compliance person that will be in charge of this that will manage these types of deals in terms of they will monitor. They will ensure that the student athlete, the kid, 18 to 22 years old. Yes, everyone, these are kids. I don't care if they're 18 and are an adult and whatnot. No, they're young kids trying to figure out where they're going and they need this direction. That the school will have someone that heads up these types of, of making sure that the kid is you know, doing the right thing. But here's, there's a couple of things to that that concern me. Number one, let's, let's make sure that those people are always making sure that the kid is doing what's in his best interest. Yeah. And number two, the NCAA lists that the schools are not going to be handing out any dollars, mm-hmm. at least in their proposed legislation. Now, that could get changed, but there is strict guideline that says that the school is not specifically the one who's making it happen. And mm-hmm. that's why I get concerned about this legislation, because, Rob, you've been saying this is taking years and years to pass. You know why it's been taking years and years to pass also? When you look at the legislation and when you look at some of the language and some of the terms within it, it's legislation that really, in my mind, would be hard to pass to begin with. The kid is not allowed to wear his school logo when he cuts a deal with a, with a company. If he puts up a, um, an, an ad with a restaurant locally, he just has to wear like blue if he plays for Kentucky. He can't wear the Kentucky logo. College basketball, part of college basketball, what is college basketball, as you said, in an ever-changing sport, is the brand name. And you know what? That brand name travels. When Gonzaga faces UCLA, and that game is what it was, we saw the TV ratings for non-football live events. College basketball was at the top. College basketball is dying. Get the hell out of here. You go kick rocks. But I just think that that there are too many, like, ifs in this legislation that make me concerned like what is the finished product going to look like and I also think finally and I'm really interested to hear your guys thoughts on this is we're already seeing without the NIL passing the concept of being a role player for certain programs has gone totally away St. John's is the top example of this Mm -hmm. they have had eight players transfer and all have transferred down, not like down a little, like down significantly. And that's where I do think the NIL is going to get interesting from a transfer standpoint, because if you're the fourth or fifth best player at St. John's, but you could go to name that mid-major, even like a higher low major that says, hey, our number one player on our team, our top scorer, we're able to negotiate and this wouldn't be in writing but negotiate a deal with the local car dealership and you're going to get x amount of dollars in this and you could get your degree get x amount of dollars and do all that that's Mm -hmm. where i do think like being a role player in college basketball gets devalued even more by the nil legislation in my opinion because it's going to be a competition between your best player and how much room is there to make money if you're the fifth or sixth best player on a team? That's true. Also, another question: What do you who if the university isn't going to be able to you know sure. pass the bill? Then who the hell is going to? Where's this money going to be coming from? Like and the best and the most important thing is to keep these kids away from boosters and so on and so oh, forth. That's exactly like, who it's going to come? So from. Like exactly. So like it's like who? Where is this money going to come from? If and how would you be able to monitor what money comes in? or not come in, like doesn't come to a certain player, like the fourth, fourth or third best player in the team, like you said, it's going to be difficult for them. But if they know uh, a certain booster and that, that has tons of money and they'll match that number on, on record, but how would you be able to, to monitor what they may, may like having extra money being given to those players? Like, how would you know? I, I don't, how would you monitor that? I, I don't necessarily know if you would, but if you're doing it like 
anywhere above board. Like if, if you're able to set something up, like, so we just did a thing over the weekend, Adam Miller, right? He just transferred yeah. from Illinois to LSU. Yeah. Adam Miller has 133 followers on Instagram. That That's a big enough following to create some kind of influencer market, right? 133K, so right? Where he, what's that? 133K. Yeah, 133,000 followers. Oh, I was about to say, yeah. Adam, I was like, Adam Miller. Enough. <laughs> I was like, but if, if you're if you're able to, if he's able to to sell ads on that, right? And if he's able to 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 do influencer stuff with those 133,000 followers that he has on Instagram, yeah. then all of a sudden, like that stuff, that that's a business, right? That there, there's an entire exactly. influencer yeah. economy. So if he has money coming in there, you can't just like ignore the fact that this company paid you 30k to tweet nah. the, or to post this thing on instagram like exactly you're gonna have to pay taxes on that yeah. right so that's the way that you monitor it when you mm-hmm. actually have this money coming in above board because that's a good point that's a good you're, point you're, you're, you're operating yeah, as a professional thing. it's but here's the all, thing. it's not just like a cash in a bag because you have to hide it from the ncaa if it's okay mm-hmm. in the eyes of the ncaa then you're going to do this as a business because these biz- mm-hmm. businesses that are paying them the money don't want to get in trouble with the IRS. They don't want to get in trouble. They, like those guys don't want to go to prison, you know? So yeah, exactly. if you open this up, then all of a sudden it becomes like normal. There's no black market. You don't have you to find, fight. You find, you find ways to make sure that it, you can keep those guardrails like we were talking about. Up yeah. And, and look, it, are there going to be situations where players take money under the table? Of yeah, course. Like, absolutely. It happens everywhere, right? Like can't what, stop it. Have any of us <laughs> never not taking money under the table? You know, like I I've I've worked jobs never. I, I was never. I didn't I didn't have a W9, right? Like I worked in construction an entire summer, didn't pay a single cent on taxes, right? Like it, <laughs> all of us do it. Like that that's just kind of like what you do growing up. I do not know what you're talking about, Rob. Yeah. I repeat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I repeat. There, there, there. I don't know what they, he's talking they, about. <laughs> Mr. Busta played, paid me a lot of money growing up to cut his back lawn. I, I cut my neighbor's lawn and he paid me a lot of money over one there summer and I did not claim anything on that crap. <laughs> yeah, so. Let me tell you, I mastered a diagonal lawn cutting. <laughs> I, I can't get there, man. Like I, I can do the, the straight lines and I'm pretty good at it. And you know, like, uh, look, I, I, I own a house now. So I take, I went full dad. I take way too much pride in my lawn. Like, my, my wife is like, why are you out there just looking at the grass? I'm like, I'm trying to see if the seeds that I like. You play the master. I want to see if it's growing. That's, that's you so play cute. the master's music <laughs> in your ear when you're looking at your grass. You're playing yeah. like master's music. You got, you're just, you're near tears. You know, like, here's the other thing though. Like for that kid that has that deal, right? Yeah. Remember, remember Jordan Tucker? It's, there's one. Yes. Remember Jordan Tucker? He played at Duke. Okay. And he, was at, he was at Butler for two years. And he, if you follow him on Instagram, I don't know how many, I think the guy's got like 500 K now hasn't been able to make it from a pro career standpoint, but the guy's making a career off just being an Instagram influencer. Like if we took away his basketball, we basketball's an add on for this kid. Yeah. Kids doing ads with coach and this company and this company, and he's a supermodel basically. Mm -hmm. So my question is if you are, let's say you're a supermodel on the side. Like, let's say you're a men's basketball player and you've just got the looks and you can do, you know, your photo shoots with name that company. Mm-hmm. So basically, if you're living the life of Deshaun Butler, more or less. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. Maybe you some some of the uh, maybe maybe like uh, so like, I get your point. Man. Don't let him interrupt what you're saying. <laughs> right. What's our what's our trimming company again? What's the company? <laughs> Those that will not be mentioned, they're not paying us anymore. So we're not going to say that. Oh, well, you know what? <laughs> Fuck them. But if you did a, if you, <laughs> yes, Fanta. If you did you. a, if you did stuff for them, okay. If you did, let's say you did stuff for them. So my question always is, like, do you have to get that, you know, check marked by the NCAA, or are you allowed to do that? You know, like, like that's that's where I say, if the kid has his own business on the side, if NIL is allowed. I hope I hope that that kid doesn't have to go through some thorough process to make sure that this gets approved by people. He's 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 going to, he's which going is to the have problem. To. I know yeah, he's going to have to, which is a problem. Yeah, and, and but I that's, that's creating that's jobs true. in a sense, though. Like you, you, you'll have a job for somebody to monitor these kids. Uh, their freaking uh, yeah. Their, the, the problem, with, the problem Honestly, that I have I with that is it has nothing to do with him being a student athlete. Like that's the only thing that I have an issue with is that is that where this deal comes about is if I'm a student at a school and I have a business, I don't have to tell anyone at the university what I'm doing with no, that. No, it's just true. So that's, that's where I do kind of, because I think a lot of these kids, if they need to find mon- monetary ways, they've got parents and uncles and aunts and people that are like, you know, those people in the circle that are always trying to figure out ways to, mm-hmm. to, to, to brand the influence. 
Like they're already doing it in college. I hope that they can benefit. I hope it's not too hard, but yeah, it's going to be a thorough process and that's where the guardrails come in. And that's where you kind of say like, how real is this going to be? And with that being said, if it is real, how, how real does it have to be for Congress to pass actual legislation? Because if you're a con like these Congress members have looked at this stuff and have, and have said, yeah, why are we, why are we giving in here on this bill? And that really creates an interesting dynamic here this summer. And remember, I've heard from multiple people, Congress is going to go on a break. Like everyone says this summer, this is going to get passed. Yeah. Congress takes a 60 day vacation guys. Yeah. And you, you can't trust the congressman as it is like, so Georgia just passed an NIL bill and it is fucking laughable, right? The way that they set it up is basically 70%, 75% of the money that these players make from third party companies can get redistributed to by by the athletic department to whoever they want to give it to, to other student athletes, which is just like, that's stupid. It's laugh. So I'm going to go on a rant. So why would someone go to Georgia then? So like so, I mean like honestly like why would anyone want to go to Georgia like it's yeah, one of those it's, it's, no I get I get that but like it's also I've been passed it's the principle of the thing right so Brian Kemp is their governor right and he le- leans uh, a certain way politically and the way yeah. that he leans tends to associate pretty strongly with the concept of capitalism right so that side of the aisle in Congress despises things like welfare or the redistribution of wealth or like finding a way to, to make sure that billionaires like Jeff Bezos can't hoard all of the money in this country. Oh my gosh. Socialism yeah. <laughs> is a slur for those po- politicians, right? Yeah. I, I don't think that I'm saying going too strong. Like they, nah. they hate that concept. There's a reason why they hate uh, AOC, right? And they hate the concept of socialism, but he just invented and signed in a bill that is socialism for student athletes. 75% of the money that they make off of their own name, image, and likeness can be redistributed and taken from them. That, that That's communism. Are you kidding yeah. me? Like that is a, that's that's socialism. Core. That is the definition of socialism. And if I was, guys, if I was just a little bit more cynical, what I would say is that it seems like a lot of these situations where white men that are in power, old white men in power that hate socialism and love capitalism, find a way to make it so it doesn't work when it's young majority black athletes that are doing the they're weaponizing, they're weaponizing, they're weaponizing but, socialism to make sure they don't get money. Yeah, they're, wepo- <laughs> they're weaponizing, they're weaponizing yeah. it, and they're making sure that the, the, the young majority black athletes that have a chance to do the capitalizing aren't able to do it. And if I was more cynical. I would say something about that, but you know, I'm not, I'm not quite that level of cynic just yet. I just wanted to, to put that little bug in your ear. So uh, we'll talk after the show. We'll talk after the show. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk after the show. <laughs>